The garage door slid upward at my electronic command. I blinked in surprise. I had nowhere to park in my own garage. My wife's silver BMW was parked in her spot on the left, but a shiny red F-150 pickup was parked in my spot on the right. Well, well, well. I've wondered before if my wife was faithful to Bev. I think I now have the answer. I recognize the truck belonging to Ted. He and his wife Charlie moved to a new house about a mile from here a year and a half or so ago. Ted is a junior partner in Bev's parents' law firm and has been with them for about eight years. Last week he was showing off his new truck to a few of us at a party at Bev's parents' house. It's deer season, and almost every male in town packs up and heads off to deer camp for the entire two-week season. This has been a tradition in this part of the South for as long as they can remember. Some wives and daughters go too, but it's mostly a male event, sort of a friends, fathers, sons thing. My wife is a girly girl, and she has zero interest in doing it in the woods overnight, let alone for two weeks. I belong to a hunting club east of town with buddies from work, and Ted belongs to a club west of town with a bunch of lawyers. A wily, blood-sucking crowd I'm happy to avoid. The season starts tomorrow morning, and I went to hunting camp at noon today to get ready. Bev expects me to be gone for a whole two weeks, as much as any other man in town. Charlie no doubt expects Ted to be at his camp for two weeks as well. So Bev just opens the garage door, Ted drives in before dawn or after dusk, Bev closes the door, and voila, you have the perfect setting for an extended secret rendezvous. The aggrieved spouses have no idea of the heated affair going on behind closed doors. The spoon of tar in the adulterer's honey barrel is that I felt sick around six o'clock today. I decided to make the two-hour drive home in case I had an emergency. I'd rather recover from the flu or something similar in the comfort of my home under the care of my devoted wife than endure it in the woods alone. That's the only reason I was here at eight o'clock in the evening, to discover this clever little love nest. Back in civilization, I grabbed some medicine at the drugstore, and now I was feeling a little better. At least I was before my discovery. I guess I'm not surprised by Bev's infidelity. She is self-absorbed, almost narcissistic like her mother. She is gorgeous and flirtatious. Men desire her, and she has the ability to go astray given my frequent travels. It's enough to give my husband pause. There is no point in resenting or worrying. Cheating spouses have a long history. They didn't put a warning about adultery in the Ten Commandments 2,500 years ago because it was a new concept. And cheating is not exclusive to both sexes. After all, it takes one of them for an affair to work properly. It might be fun to go in, get tad up and make a scene, but in the end it doesn't accomplish anything useful. I now have accurate information about my wife's infidelity. The question is, what's the best way to use this to my advantage? I turn off the truck's headlights, close the garage door, and slip away. The house sits on a three-acre lot at the end of a cul-de-sac. A large neighborhood lake is behind the house with a swampy creek coming out of the lake dam, and running in a ravine along the far side of my house, and then bobbing on the other side of the street in front of the house. This leaves my house pretty isolated. The garage is at the far end of the house, by the ravine. It is unlikely that adulterous lovers or any nosy neighbors have noticed my arrival or departure. Although I belong to a hunting camp, I also enjoy my solitude. I purchased a five-acre parcel of land adjacent to the camp. My lot includes a pond and a small two-bedroom farmhouse where I live. I hunt on land leased by the club and will probably go up to the main club property to shoot with the guys and maybe have a beer. But overall, I enjoy my secluded time at the farmhouse for my two-week escape from the world. In the summer, Bev and some of her friends come out to swim in the pond and sunbathe. I get roped into making cocktails for the bathing beauties and frying catfish for lunch, it's a pleasant duty, as there's quite a lot of naked feminine loveliness basking in the sun. Given the remoteness of the pond, the girls sometimes get rather daring in what they expose to the sunlight of Helios, which of course I don't mind. Well, tonight I have a two-hour drive back to the hunting camp and farm to contemplate my predicament and plan a plan of action. In high school, I was an honors student and a good baseball player. My family has a long military tradition, and I wanted to go to one of the U.S. military academies, VMI or the Citadel. But my dad was very sick, so I accepted a baseball scholarship to a state university that was only 50 miles from home. While I was a standout in high school and American Legion baseball, college was a big step up. 
I played, but was just a solid, very solid player, not a star. It probably didn't help that I was an engineer with a heavy course load. I went as far as I was going to go with baseball, but excelled more academically. It was the Vietnam era, so I planned to do my part and joined an army company. After graduating from college, I went into the army as a junior lieutenant in the infantry. Nine months later, I was in the Mekong Delta with the 9th Infantry Division. I was a battalion assistant C3 for two months and then was assigned as a rifle platoon leader. It turns out I had a talent for leading men into battle, accomplishing the mission, killing the enemy, and keeping my men as safe as possible. I was wounded once by grenade shrapnel in my left arm and back. The wounds were minor, nothing compared to what some poor guys went through. I was back in the field within ten days, and I was ashamed to receive a purple heart for those minor wounds, considering how some of the other guys had suffered. After my tour in Vietnam, I was assigned to Fort Benning to train soldiers who were going off to war. After my tour of duty, I used my GI Bill to get a master's degree in engineering from the University of Texas. This, along with my veteran's preference, led me to work at a NASA lab in Bev's hometown. Bev was a widow during the Vietnam War. Her husband was an Air Force Academy graduate who was shot down and killed over North Vietnam on his 12th mission. No body has been recovered. He and Bev had been married 18 months. Mary, a female scientist in my group, went to college with Bev and introduced me to her at a party. Mary is a born matchmaker, and she begged me to ask Bev out. I was blown away from the start. Bev was a stunning beauty, bright and flirty. But she was way out of my league. I had never been a Romeo and had only dated sporadically and without much success. I'd never had a serious girlfriend. Too busy with baseball, school, or military service to indulge in such subtleties of civilized life. Nevertheless, Bev responded warmly to my advances, though I'm sure she found my clumsy attempts amusing. Five months later, we were married. That was four years ago. I've always wondered why a beauty like Bev would pay attention to me, let alone marry me. Louise, an elderly secretary at work, gave me the inside female scoop, explaining, John, we don't have a shortage of good men to marry in these parts. There are plenty of rednecks, hay farmers, slackers, drunks, drug addicts, used car salesmen, self-centered jerks, weak-minded morons, and worthless. But you're a smart guy. You have a good job with great future potential. You're a war hero, which won't hurt the girls around here. Wouldn't cut the mustard up north or on the west coast, but it's pure gold with the girls around here. Your mom taught you good manners on top of that. You're a handsome former athlete and ex-soldier that would make any healthy girl drool. Heck, if Bev hadn't picked you up so quickly, I have a pretty niece in college that I was going to introduce you to when she came home this summer. Southern women in that era really analyzed the world differently than their men. Like most men, I fell in love with the outer packaging and forgot to look under the hood to see what made that model tick. There was nothing wrong with that, but there was nothing really right about it either. Bev and I get along, we do things together, sex is great, we travel, but we're very different people. She's a socialite. She spends her days at the country club playing tennis and golf with friends, loves to party, and immerses herself in the general vortex of the social structure of a small southern town. I'm more of a loner, love to read, enjoy my technical work that is of no interest to the general public, and travel frequently for work. That's all fine, but things just aren't quite right. Bev is spoiled, the only daughter of the best lawyers in town, a woman who values the comforts and privileges that money can buy, and a lady of fierce pride. Any divorce from her would be contentious and very expensive. But if I can clearly prove adultery, I can dictate the terms of the divorce and get a quiet, quick settlement. I'll just write this marriage off as an experience. The next morning I went back to town first thing. The bank was open Saturday morning, so I transferred all of our money into the new accounts. I canceled the credit cards that were in Bev's name and transferred all the mutual funds to the new accounts. That took care of what I could do on the financial end of the approaching storm. I figured Bev would be busy with her lover, not figuring out what I had done. Then I stopped by a lawyer I'd met while playing softball in a church league. He, too, was a Vietnam veteran and was happy to help. He briefly instructed me over a couple cups of coffee at his home. If not for treason, I would have paid dearly for my freedom in this state. He also warned me that Bev's parents would be stiff opponents in the divorce fight. He explained that her parents were both tough, abusive, legal geniuses. 
I made an appointment for 8 a.m. Monday at my friend's office to begin the official battle. My next stop was the library, where I did some reading about state divorce laws and the requirements for proof of adultery. Based on that research and what my lawyer friend told me, essentially, I have to prove Bev's propensity and ability to commit adultery. I don't have to have a picture of them at the scene, although that would certainly be icing on the cake. However, now that I know about the cheating, I also have to be careful not to do anything that Bev could claim condoned the betrayal. So going back home and pretending everything was fine wasn't the smartest option. I realized it was better to act now than later. I walked into Bo's Army-Navy store. Bo was a veteran of the Korean War and collected all sorts of military stuff. His store was a veritable museum of military artifacts. In the back room, he kept many neat military toys that the authorities disapproved of for civilians. But to Bo, they were treasures. I bought a few items and spent the obligatory hour sipping coffee with Bo and swapping war stories. Finally, I stopped by to see Jen, the wife of my best friend in town. Her husband George and I had played baseball together in college, and eventually both of us ended up working in a lab. I kicked George out of the room so I could talk to Jen alone. With some effort, I convinced her to make two short recordings for me on my tape recorder. She's a smart girl, quickly ascertained the circumstances of my request, and asked very insightful questions. I referred to the fact that I expected her to help me by placing the blame on her for our longtime friendship, swore her to secrecy, and promised to explain everything in a few days. I had missed lunch and was starving, so I grabbed a bite to eat at Applebee's and contemplated my plan for the evening. I would have loved a drink, but opted for coffee to keep a clear head. I headed out and arrived at the edge of the woods on the opposite side of the lake from my house a little after 4.30. As the sun set, I cautiously descended into the thickening dusk into the ravine, crossed the creek, and slipped into the woods along the lakeshore. I emptied my bladder in the woods of the ravine, for there is nothing worse than lying in an ambush or observation post and wanting for little. I set up in a thicket of red bakai at the edge of our yard, about fifty feet from the house. I was dressed in hunting camouflage, common local men's clothing this time of year, and I was well concealed in the dark. I had binoculars and had a good view of the kitchen window and the back-covered porch, but nothing else. Around 5.30, Bev showed up in the kitchen and started fiddling with dinner. A few minutes later, Ted showed up with drinks for them. Apparently, a martini with a couple of olives was the favorite drink tonight. They chatted animatedly for a few minutes, and then Ted left and reappeared on the porch. He fired up my grill and went back into the kitchen to give my wife a little kiss. Having a little fun, she chased him away with a plate of steaks. Ted came back with the steaks cooked, and they had a lot of fun and lively banter and teasing with each other as they arranged their plates. All in all, it was a very enjoyable Rockwellian scene. The only problem was that it was my wife and my house, but the other man enjoyed them both. The mischievous couple disappeared from the kitchen, no doubt to enjoy their steaks in the dining room. I slipped through the back door into the utility room, using my key to unlock the door. Bev keeps the sliding door to the kitchen closed, as the utility room is always too unkempt to be in public view. I opened the door ajar. I could hear Bev and Ted talking, and I thought they were enjoying a romantic candlelit dinner in the dining room. I continued on to the garage where I deflated the right side tires of Ted's truck. I have an electric air pump under my workbench. I removed the pump hose and slipped it into my backpack. Even if it had occurred to Ted to look for my pump, it would be useless now. His truck was temporarily stuck outside my house, and his independent mobility was limited to his legs. Then I checked the phone in the garage, and it was working. We have a pantry that has doors to the utility room adjacent to the kitchen and to the dining room where Bev and Ted were enjoying dinner. I slipped into the pantry from the utility room and dropped down next to the door to the dining room. I could hear the cheating couple's conversation as clearly as if I were sitting at the same table with them. Ted was saying, You picked out some great steaks. I love that wine, too. I didn't realize John was a wine connoisseur. Always thought of him as a jock guy drinking beer. Bev laughed. Oh, you underestimate John. After we got married, he found out I liked wine and became a real connoisseur to please me. Don't kid yourself. That boy is a smart crackerjack. Yesterday, I heard a girly gossip at the club that he's going to be sent back to grad school at the lab next year. He doesn't know that yet. John can be clueless sometimes.
Well, at least that's good news, I thought. Where do you think he'll be headed? Ted asked. I suspect the University of Texas again. There's a professor there he really likes, and they keep in touch, my wife replied. Are you going to go with him? To Austin? Do I look like a cowgirl to you? It's just a year for coursework and then a thesis in the lab. I'll stay here and run the household like a good little housewife, Bev laughed. It can be a very exciting year for you without a steady husband. Does he suspect you're cheating on him? John? No, he's just a simple country lad, God bless him. I make sure he is fully entertained in bed and he is consumed with his work, which is beyond anything I understand. Between his workload and traveling, I can easily indulge myself when I want male variety in my sex life. I'm looking forward to next year, Ted blurted out cooingly. But I won't be alone, will I? My wife laughed. Of course not, Ted. I like the buffet, not the diet. Do you realize I've been sleeping with you longer than I've been sleeping with John? I guess that's true, Ted said cheerfully. Bev laughed even louder. Oh my God, do you remember that time my parents came home early and caught us naked on the couch? I thought Dad was going to have a stroke. Ted regretfully joined in the laughter. Would I ever forget? I only worked for your parents for about a year then. There I was fucking their married daughter right in their living room. As I recall, your husband had just left for Vietnam a week earlier. I was sure I was about to be fired, if not shot. Oh, I would have been, but Mom stepped in and saved your ass. I knew some kind of miracle had happened. Pour me some more wine, Bev continued, and I'll tell you the rest of the story. A minute later, my giggling wife continued her tale. The next day, my mother took me to lunch at the club. There, she gave me a diploma course on adultery pointed out my mistakes that got us caught, explained the laws regarding adultery, emphasized that caution and careful planning were necessary to avoid detection, and told me a bunch of methods and good places for secret rendezvous. You've got to be kidding me, Ted exclaimed. No, turns out mom had been cheating on dad since before they were married, and it was down to a science. Said her mom was the same way. I can't believe it's grandma. She always seemed like such an unapproachable and strict old lady. It's hard to imagine her hiking up her skirts to every man she laid eyes on. Anyway, I seem to be the latest in a long family line of serial adulterers. I think the women in my family just like variety and enjoy taking risks and getting naughty. It's a real family legacy. I could hear the amusement in Bev's voice when she asked. Okay, Ted, I have to ask. Have you ever slept with my mom? Hmm, do I really have to answer that question? Bev laughed. No. I can guess the answer. I'm pretty sure your early junior partner status was earned by the sweat of your forehead between my mom's legs. There may be some truth to that, Ted replied surreptitiously. Ah, so you enjoyed having a mother and daughter tooting horns at my father, my late husband, and now my current husband. My, my, what a depraved creature you are. No wonder we get along so well. I certainly learned a lot about my wife tonight. I had no idea. Bev continued her interrogation. So what about your wife? Does Charlie suspect something? You know, she and I went to high school and college together and even lived together for a while. She's a smart girl, much smarter than you. I always wondered why she married you. As I recall, you screwed me on your wedding day, and that was, what, five years ago? Ted replied grimly. Ah, uh, things have been a bit tense at home lately. Yes, Charlie is suspicious, but I'm careful and not as active as you. Ted continued. I think the future of my marriage to Charlie doesn't promise anything good. But I have to be smart about how to get out of it with my skin intact in this state. I had met Ted Charlie's wife, well, Charlene to be exact, a few times at parties and at the club. She was attractive and, as Bev said, very intelligent. Often the intelligence of a beautiful woman is overlooked because of her looks. But if you talk to Charlie, it is immediately clear that she is a very intelligent girl. I've always enjoyed her company. What about you? Are you going to stay with John? Oh, God, yes, Bev replied. He's just what I need in a husband. I do love him. I'm just not faithful to him. We're talking about having children eventually. He is the perfect genetic material for that and would be a great father. No, he's a keeper. Ted remarked, Bev, you like the finer things in life. I always envisioned you marrying a rich man, not a government research engineer. You need someone to support you in the style you're used to. Well, John's doing pretty well for himself. Mom and Dad are rich and give me money. 
they've always been good about spoiling their only daughter. On top of that, there's Grandma and Grandpa's trust fund that they left me. It all comes together to make a nice financial package. I've always suspected that my relatives gave Bev money, but the trust fund, now that's news. Bev changed the subject. All this talk of adultery gets me excited. The wine and steaks are gone. I'll take the plates to the kitchen. Why don't you pour us some cognac? Damn, I wish they'd stop drinking my good drinks. I heard Bev scrape the plates into the trash can and set them in the sink as I slipped back into the back room. Ted reappeared in the dining room with two glasses of my cognac, and he and his wife enjoyed a long, testing kiss while I watched them through the ajar door. Ted's hands were taking liberties with my wife's body, but she didn't seem to mind. When they broke the kiss to take a breath of air, Bev exhaled. Let's go to the study and finish our brandy. They walked away, out of sight, toward the den. I could hear faint moans and happy groans coming from the den, but the traitors were out of my sight. After about twenty minutes, my wife and Ted, both now naked, hurried down the hallway I could see to our bedroom. Soon a cacophony of laughter and joyful squeals came from our bedroom. The lovers were hard at work enjoying each other. Now it was our CEC, and it was time to get moving. I walked into the garage and made my first phone call. The phone rang twice, and then Charlie came on the line. Hello? I scrolled through Jen's first entry into the phone. Hi, Charlie. It's your friend. Ted's having an affair with Bev. You're about to find them both at her house. What? Charlie replied, stammering. I hung up the phone and called the fire department. The first call was answered, and I turned on Jen's second recording. Get over here as soon as possible. The house at 8 Magnolia Drive is on fire. There's smoke billowing out of it and people inside. I hung up as soon as the tape ended. I had to act fast. I probably had no more than five or six minutes before the fire department and Charlie showed up at the front door. I turned on the tactical red flashlight I'd bought at Bo's store. I grabbed a metal garbage can from the garage and put it in the kitchen. Then I hurried to the front door, turned on the front porch and exterior garage lights, and ran back to the study. In a moment of inspiration, I grabbed my wife and Ted's scattered clothes and threw them into the back room. I pulled a gas mask out of my backpack, also from Bo, and put it on. Damn, that military training never leaves you. Then I pulled out two smoke grenades and a canister of CS tear gas and threw them into a metal trash can. The tear gas was from Bo's unofficial and illegal stash of military toys. After finishing my business, I retreated to the back room and waited. Out of petty anger, I pulled Ted's driver's license and credit cards out of his wallet and put them in my pocket. I would destroy them later, just to hurt Ted from being without them and having to replace them. He had my wife right there in the hallway, so a little pettiness on my part seemed justified. The smoke grenades and tear gas canister hissed and released a dense cloud of smoke and tear gas, quickly filling the kitchen, and then the cloud wafted into the adjoining dining room and office. Military tear gas is actually an aerosolized dispersion of fine powder, not an actual gas. Despite this subtle distinction, the smoke alarm in the kitchen began to roar, and the one at the hallway entrance leading to the bedrooms quickly followed suit. The squealing of the alarm elicited surprised exclamations from my wife and Ted. I heard them rushing down the hallway from the bedrooms. My wife screamed, Something's burning in the kitchen. They made it to the kitchen door before tear gas rained down on them. For a moment, they were fine and rushed forward to put out the fire. The next moment they were bent in half, gasping and coughing and screaming in pain, wiping their eyes, intensifying the burning. Snot flowed freely. Tear gas is a sneaky and merciless enemy. Ted shouted, the smoke is poisonous, get out, get out, get out. He gallantly nudged my wife toward the front door. I'll take our clothes. Ted had some sort of fictitious exemption during the Vietnam era draft, so he never served in the military. Consequently, he didn't recognize the effects of tear gas as any military veteran would. I could hear Ted struggling in the smoke-filled den, trying in vain to find their clothes, which were now stacked in the back room next to me. After a few seconds, the tear gas proved too strong and he followed my wife to the front door. I heard fire sirens in the distance and hurried into the office. I quickly scattered my wife and Ted's clothes across the room again. I tossed my wife's panties to hang from the top of the ceiling chandelier for a good look. It would take a ladder to steal Bev's panties. The first fire truck lights were flashing in the front window, so it was time for me to leave. 
I ran back into the kitchen, put on insulated gloves, and grabbed a metal trash can with tear gas canisters. I went out the back door of the utility room, locked it behind me, and ran into the woods. As I passed the lake, I stopped to throw the still-smoking smoke grenades and tear gas canister as far into the lake as possible, then ran back to my truck. It was only eight o'clock. Then I drove back to the hunting camp, tossing the metal trash can into the dumpster on the way out of town. Unfortunately, I could not be in front of my house to witness the results of my Machiavellian machinations, so later, others present relayed the following to me. I could only enjoy the events indirectly. The fire department and Charlie Theta arrived simultaneously, followed by a growing crowd of curious neighbors attracted by the sirens and lights. Tear gas smoke was wafting from the open front door. The outdoor lights I turned on illuminated a bizarre scene. My wife was on all fours, vomiting. Ted was bent over her, putting his hands on his knees and breathing deeply. Both were naked as newborns. Charlie walked over to Ted, who straightened up at her approach. Without saying a word, she kicked him in the balls. This elicited a cry of pain from him and a collective gasp from the watching crowd of neighbors. Ted collapsed to the ground next to Bev with a groan. Charlie stood over him and unleashed a torrent of profanity that no one expected to hear from a poised southern lady like her. The fireman grabbed Charlie and pulled her away from Bev and Ted, who were still choking, coughing, and crying. Charlie continued to verbally skin Ted from a distance. A sheriff's deputy arrived to take charge of keeping Charlie and Ted apart. One team of firefighters made their way to the front door looking for the source of the smoke. The other team went around the back of the house and cracked the back door of the utility room to approach the fire from the other side. Due to the thick smoke, the firefighters were wearing breathing apparatus, so they were unaware that the smoke cloud contained tear gas. A second fire truck and two more sheriff's department vehicles arrived. My neighbors kept their eyes peeled. Somewhere along the way, some good Samaritan brought Bev and Ted blankets to cover their public nudity. By pure coincidence, there was a local TV crew filming the aftermath of a highway accident about two miles from my house. They were just finishing up when they heard the fire department and police calling on the scanner about a fire at my house. They rushed right over to join the party in my front yard. There were probably about 50 neighbors standing around gawking. The morning news on TV the next day had a great episode showing the crowd watching the smoke rising from the house as the firemen came and went. The best part was that they showed a shot of my wife and Ted wrapped in blankets and staring dumbly at the smoking house. Finally, one of the firefighters came out and told the scene commander, There is no fire. There's a lot of very acrid smoke, but we can't find any fire. Jim Bob is checking the attic right now, but we don't see anything burned. The scene commander suggested Ted and Bev should not stay in the house until it has been thoroughly checked for electrical or gas problems. Bev said, I'm going to my parents' house. Ignoring our neighbors and their offers to help, Bev entered the house quickly dressed in the bedroom and drove off in her BMW. Ted nodded and said, I think I'll go to the Holiday Inn. The sheriff added dryly, That's probably wise. Ted was slower than Bev as he had to gather up his scattered clothes. When he tried to get his truck out of the garage, he became aware of two flat tires. His truck was stuck half in the garage, half out of it. One of his neighbors finally took pity on him and gave him a ride to the Holiday Inn. There, he discovered he had no credit cards and only $25 in cash. He called Bev, who gave the Holiday Inn clerk her credit card over the phone, only to find out that her credit card had been canceled. Bev's father finally had to step in and give his personal card over the phone before Ted could get a room for the night. My wife and her lover were very unhappy people. I went straight back to the hunting camp and went to bed. The next morning, I got up before dawn and walked out to a remote deer paddock. It took me a while to hide my gas mask, flashlight, and gloves deep in the woods. After that, I loafed around and didn't return to the farm until almost one o'clock in the afternoon. Indeed, there was a stranger sitting on my porch. It was a thin, elderly man with graying hair. As I approached, the stranger said, Hi, you must be John. Yes, I replied. John, my name is Jimmy. I'm an arson investigator for the fire department. I looked at him questioningly. A strange thing happened at your house last night. There was a fire. I interrupted him, feigning concern. Was Bev hurt? How bad is the damage? No, no, she's fine. The funny thing about that fire, 
There was a bunch of smoke, but even looking this morning in daylight, we can't find any sign of fire. Smoke, but no fire? I'm not sure I understand, I replied, trying to sound confused. Jimmy sighed. Neither do I. Been doing this for 20 years, and I've never seen anything like this. I just stood there looking appropriately puzzled. I mentioned that your wife and neighbor, Ted, were knocked down by smoke, burst into flames right in front of the entire neighborhood, firefighters, sheriff's department, and television reporters, not to mention Ted's wife. I shook my head. No, you didn't mention that, I said, suppressing a chuckle. You don't seem surprised that your wife is flirting with your neighbor. It was my turn to sigh. Well, if you've seen my wife and what the hell she's wearing, you know she's a beautiful creature. Any husband with a wife like that knows there's always a chance she'll have a flirtation when he turns his back. Sad, but a fact of life. Jimmy nodded. Yes, it's true. Like that old song says, something like, If you want to be happy the rest of your life, never make a beautiful woman your wife. I guess there's some wisdom in that, I agreed. Funny thing about your wife and Ted's symptoms, it certainly looks like they were hit by some kind of tear gas. The fire department said the smoke was pretty heavy. Tear gas, yeah, that seems unlikely. Yes, it is illegal to have it in this state unless you are a police officer or military. I didn't say anything back. You know, only you and Ted's wife, Charlie, have an incentive to do something like smoke two naked adulterers in public with tear gas. That's a pretty interesting plan. I slowly replied, well, I've been in hunting camp since Friday afternoon. Jimmy ignored my proffered alibi and continued. Talked to Charlie this morning before I came here. Well, that girl's a firecracker, isn't she? Yes, of course she is, I agreed. Charlie says she doubted her husband's fidelity but didn't know anything definite. She says she got a call from a woman saying her husband was at your house with your wife. Young woman, 20 or so, southern accent, good diction, probably well-educated. But Charlie didn't recognize that voice. That call was just before the so-called fire. That allowed Charlie and the rest of your neighbors to arrive just as your naked wife ran out of the house. Jimmy was waiting to hear what I had to say. Now, if Ted, or for that matter, your wife had been shot, stabbed, or poisoned, Charlie would have been first on the list of suspects as the perpetrator. Jimmy pursed his lips thoughtfully. But this operation had been smooth, carefully planned down to the smallest detail, and executed with precision. Charlie wasn't that kind of woman. Hell, she'd just pull you away and stab you in the forehead, eye to eye, and then she'd twist the knife. She's not the kind of girl to waste time maneuvering to stab you in the back. Yeah, I can see that, I agreed. But you're a guy, smart, military, an effective combat leader, an engineer, on the other hand, you're exactly the kind of guy who knows how to do it, how to plan it and then actually execute it. I shrugged. What can I say? I've been there, at the camp, on the hunt. Jimmy smiled tiredly. Ah, yes, your alibi. I stopped by the main camp before I visited you. The gossip in this county is incredible. They all knew all about the whole affair. They all swear they saw you at camp all weekend. In fact, Henry swears that at about eight o'clock last night, he was sure the two of you were having a beer. It was just about eight o'clock that the so-called fire started. Jimmy sighed heavily. John, you have good friends and they like you a lot. But please tell them for me that they're not lying for shit. He continued. Interestingly enough, the fire department dispatcher who got the call about the fire at your house said they also got a call from a woman. Their description of the woman sounded exactly the same as Charlie's caller. In both cases, the woman gave her speech without asking any questions and hung up. You could almost think they were tapes. Jimmy watched me for a minute and then continued his monologue. You know, I can do some tests, and I'm sure I can find tear gas residue in your house. I can fill out a bunch of paperwork and find out what number Charlie and the fire department called last night. That could be interesting. This morning I found a man's footprints by the lake behind your house, about your size, I'd say. I suspect that if I fill the lake with divers, I'll find some tear gas canisters. I bet if I go around the Army and Navy surplus stores, I might find records of interesting recent purchases. Not tear gas, of course, since that's illegal. But maybe things like gas masks would be useful for that. Man, that Jimmy's no fool, I thought to myself. I'm a fan of dealing with a grandmaster. Jimmy stood up and stretched. But money's tight these days. 
I got a whole bunch of bullshit cases to investigate. There was no property damage. No one was hurt. It's your property anyway. It would take a month of government lawyers on Sundays just to figure out what crime, if any, was committed. I guess there's not much point in wasting money and time on that. Jimmy took a deep breath. But I just wouldn't want anyone to think they got away with anything when they didn't. Well, I've got a long drive into town, so I better get going. I called out as Jimmy headed to his car. Thanks, Jimmy. Message received five out of five. Jimmy turned around and smiled, recognizing the old military radio terminology. It was a good plan, Captain. Mission accomplished. Now don't waste any more time on her. Get on with your life. Jimmy got in his car and drove back to town. Epilogue. I quickly gathered my things and headed back to my house. This year's hunting season was over for me. I went in to explain to George and Jan what I had promised her for taking notes for me. They had seen a commercial on TV about a fire that turned out not to be a fire. They recognized Bev, but not Ted, and easily put the obvious two and two together. It took a while to quench Jen's curiosity and thirst for every detail. George just sat there shaking his head and laughing occasionally. I thanked Jen again for her help and headed home, not feeling pleased that I would soon have to deal with Bev. When I got home, I found that Ted had somehow taken his truck and the message light was flashing on my phone. Bev called about every hour starting at 7 in the morning. The messages were basically, John, I'm at my parents' house. Call me as soon as you get this message. As the day progressed, she became more and more annoyed, and phrases like, Damn, John, where are you? We need to talk. And, Please talk to me before you do anything, began to be added to the recorded messages. I really didn't want to deal with Bev right now, so I ignored the messages. I skipped lunch again and was looking in the fridge contemplating making a sandwich when the doorbell rang. I opened the door and saw Charlie standing there with a wry smile. Charlie is usually a very collected and chipper lady. Today she just looked tired and exhausted. She said, Hi, John. Now I assume you already know all about last night. Yes, I replied. Good. Then I won't have to explain it again. She smiled, which made her look more like herself. We're in the same boat, you and I. Invite me in and offer me a drink. We have a lot to talk about. Come on in, Charlie. What would you like to drink? Somehow Charlie's impudent imposter invitation brought me out of my despondency. How about a glass of wine? She replied. White or red? I have an Italian Pinot Grigio or an Oregon Pinot Noir. How about a Pinot Grigio? Have a seat in the study. I'll get you some wine. I heard giggling coming from the study. When I joined her with the wine, I found Charlie smiling, looking at Bev's panties still hanging from the chandelier. The rest of Bev's clothes from last night were still strewn across the floor. Are these from Bev? She giggled, pointing to the panties. I nodded. Charlie laughed, picked up her wine, and sat down. Are you going to leave them there? Some sort of permanent decoration or trophy or something? Then she added more sadly, It's probably more like a monk wearing a shirt made of hair for self-abuse at this point. Charlie sighed and her temporary good mood vanished. How long have you known about them? Since Friday night when I got home early from hunting camp and found Ted's pickup in the garage. Did you know or suspect anything? Charlie shook her head sadly. Well... At least you're only 24 hours ahead of me in the knowing process. I suspected Ted of cheating about a year after we got married, but I never had any real proof. Or even enough to do much more than make me wonder if I was paranoid. Apparently my instincts were right. I'm afraid so, I added. You know Bev and I have been close friends since middle school. I just can't believe that she, of all people, could fuck my husband. Charlie was quiet for a moment, then continued with a cynical laugh. Actually, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. How much do you know about your wife and her cheating? I've learned a few things since Friday, but I probably only know the tip of the iceberg. Charlie smiled sadly. Well, Bev has always been a cheater, even in high school and college. She cheated on her pilot husband even when he was fighting in Vietnam. And she cheated on you, probably every time you went out of town. I think Bev is turned on by the danger and the thrill of it, flaunting convention, eating forbidden fruit or something. She can't seem to help herself. Charlie turned and looked straight at me. Are you going to take her back? No, I have an appointment with a lawyer tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Charlie breathed a sigh of relief. Good. 
One of the reasons I came to talk to you was to tell you that she's not going to change. You deserve better from your wife. You nailed her for cheating without hesitation. She's a great woman and can get men around her. Charlie wagged her finger at me for emphasis. But don't you dare take her back. I smiled at my lecturing neighbor. I won't, trust me. How about you, Charlie? Are you taking Ted back? No way. I'd castrate him if I could get away with it. I smiled, remembering what Jimmy had said earlier in camp about Charlie's ferocity. Would you like to come with me tomorrow morning and meet with my lawyer? We have essentially the same case. It probably makes sense to use the same lawyer. Charlie smiled. You run faster than I do. Yeah, I'd love to go with you. Let's get this thing running. I'll pick you up tomorrow morning at 7.30, I offered. The meeting is set for eight. It's a deal. There was a pause and Charlie changed the subject. John, the whole thing on Saturday night was strange. I had an arson investigator talk to me. I think his name was Jimmy or something. Saturday night wasn't an accident, was it? Were you behind all this? I thought about it for a minute. There was no longer any legal threat from Jimmy. Charlie was now an ally in the upcoming divorce wars. Why not? So I detailed the events, which in places caused bursts of laughter. It felt good to share this story with someone. There is nothing funny about having a complex operation and not being able to brag about it afterward. Bragging in front of an admiring pretty woman is so much better. When I got to the parts about Bev and Ted's history of infidelity, Charlie was incredulous. He slept with Bev's mom to get a promotion. Surprising, but typical, I guess. Bev's mom and grandma fooled around, too. I know them both. Well, at least I thought I did. Bev's mom was giving Bev advice on how to commit treason. I just can't believe it. When I told Charlie about how Ted screwed Bev on their wedding day, Charlie exploded. You didn't know Bev was my maid of honor, damn her soul. Our therapeutic bitch session did us both good and lifted our spirits. It was a cathartic experience, and we made new friendships by sharing our sorrows. We also drank an entire bottle of wine, which probably didn't hurt either. The phone rang. Bev, no doubt, I said with a grimace. Charlie answered, she's not stopping. Might as well deal with her now as later. I picked up the phone and put it on speaker so my new divorce ally could hear. I said neutrally, hi. John, I've been desperately trying to find you. I'll be right there. We need to talk, honey. Bev, there's nothing to talk about. Don't come to me. Look, John, I can explain. I've got a lot to answer for, honey, but, uh, Bev, you're a liar. Why continue this farce? We're done. Charlie gave me the thumbs up. Look, John, please, I know you're mad, Bev cooed in a soothing voice, and you have every right to be angry. I'll make it up to you. Let me come over and explain everything. We'll go to counseling. We can make this work. No, I'm seeing a lawyer tomorrow. We're done. You go your way and I'll go mine. No recriminations. Another thumbs up from Charlie. Since entreaties and pleas didn't work, Bev shifted gears as smoothly as a Porsche pulling into the oncoming lane. She went on the attack. Okay, you miserable son of a bitch, daddy will represent me. He's the best lawyer in the state. He'll tear your lawyer's ass up. I calmly replied, your father is a very good lawyer. However, does he know about your mom's long history of adultery, like your mom and Ted? There was dead silence in the receiver for probably 30 seconds. You bugged our house, she shrieked. No, I didn't bug the house. You couldn't have known any other way. Now it hit her. Sorry, Peeping Tom. You were in the house and you bugged us. You set the whole thing up, you son of a bitch. Damn you. She gasped at the realization. You threw my panties on the chandelier. I know I left them on the end table. I had to go naked, wrapped in a blanket in front of those giggling firemen with my panties dangling over their heads. Damn your pathetic soul, you humiliated me in front of the whole town. I calmly replied, No, Bev, you humiliated yourself in front of the whole town. I heard you and Ted even got on the morning TV news. The fight came out of it. I held up my winning hand and didn't blink. She said, Have your lawyer contact Dad. At least we can be civilized. Then she hung up. Charlie laughed and chimed in melodiously. You gotta know when to hold them, know when to drop them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. Then Charlie said thoughtfully, Wow, I hope Ted is as sensible as that. I'm sure he won't be. Of course, I'll take him to the cleaners. Well, I've got to get home. My mom's coming over to see how I'm doing. How are you feeling? 
I asked. Better, much better. Thanks for talking to me. I walked Charlie to the door and opened it for her. She turned, stood on tiptoe, and kissed me. Slowly at first and more intimate as I returned her kiss. Finally, she broke the kiss and said, Phew, I've wanted to do this since I first met you. Would you like to come over for dinner tomorrow night? Sure, I replied. How many times do you think they slept with each other? Charlie asked. I really don't know. I think a lot based on the way they talked. Well, then I guess we'd better start the scoring tomorrow night. Come ready to work at dinner. With those words, Charlie headed for her car with the sassy grace that only women are capable of.